Ride Show. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I am the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and I've recorded more than 5,000 interviews going back to 2003, all of which are available at scotthorton.org. You can also sign up for the podcast feed. The full archive is also available at youtube.com slash Show. Okay, guys, on the line, I've got Grant Smith. And, of course, he wrote The Israel Lobby Enters State Government. That thing is the most absurd book in the whole... I swear to God, you guys got to read it. It's so funny and crazy. Um, anyway, um, he wrote a whole bunch more books before that, uh, all about the Israelis uh, stealing their nuclear weapon supplies from the United States and all about their uh, stealing secret trade documents, and all these things. He's at the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy and a whole mess of books and a whole mess of articles just like that. We run, I think, every single bit of it at antiwar.com. And uh, that includes the latest here. Are Christian Zionists the largest pro-Israel lobby? Welcome back, Grant. How are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me back. Very happy to have you here. Ah, big, important, controversial question here about... um, whether it's the fact that really it's a John Hagee and the Christians United for Israel and the right-wing born-again evangelical Christians who believe that it's the end of days and Jesus is about to come back and that the Jews have to control uh, Palestine in order to cause mm-hmm. that to happen. And yep. so uh, are they really what's responsible for America's pro-Israel policy? You say nay? Yeah, I, I think that their impact is vastly overrated. And I just asked people in that article to do a very simple thought experiment, and I'm just going to rephrase it right now. That experiment is, if you remove Kufi from the equation, does the Jerusalem uh, embassy move from Tel Aviv still happen? And the answer is yes. You remove APAC from that equation, and they got involved back in 1995 with the Jerusalem Embassy Act. And all the years of lobbying that they did to make that happen, does it still happen? No, it doesn't. So the argument is really, uh, are all of these claims that are pretty much saying that they're behind all of these recent policy moves true? And I would say that as the lobby that matters, it's not true. They don't matter that much. Yeah. Well... So um, now here's the thing. In yeah. um, Mearsheimer and Walt's book, The Lobby, they tell mm-hmm. the story, and uh, some of this is in my book a little bit, um, about how after September 11th, Colin Powell said, hey, a 90% approval rating. Now's our chance to force the Israelis to give up the West Bank and have a two-state solution thing. And Bush seemed to be leaning that way because he didn't know and Colin Powell was seemed to be making sense I guess uh, uh, something. and then Tom DeLay came to town or came I guess uh, down the street uh, to the White House and told Bush hey remember how your dad lost his bid for re-election well right. would you like to lose yours because I will help to lead all of the Christian evangelical vote against you if you push this two-state solution stuff on Ariel Sharon right now. And Mm -hmm. so there was the House whip whipping the President of the United States right into line there, and then that was the end of that. And I'm sure there was more to it than that, but that was certainly one major facet of it. And so uh, how much does that count to you, do you think? And Donald Trump sure seems to say, hey, it is the, the Christian Zionists who... They appreciated me moving the embassy to Jerusalem more than any Jews did, he said. He absolutely says that. He absolutely attributes their influence and presence as being the causal sort of, this is why I did it. And I'm not saying to just say, well, does everything President Trump says uh, is that how it actually happened, or is that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, not necessarily, uh, Grant. I can okay, see that. All right, so we're agreed on that. He it's seems a, to be but... speaking his mind a little bit there. They're like, ah, oh, geez, <laughs> it seems to be like something he's noticing. Like, hardly any Jews have thanked me for that, but the born again Christians, boy, they're enthusiastic as can be, which is 
true, certainly, of some of their leaders. I don't want to paint too broad of a brush because I know there's got to be a hundred different kinds of Protestants in this country or more. Yeah, it's true. And I, I just did a long, long session with Reverend Don Wagner uh, that's posted on YouTube right now. It's mm -hmm. called Christian Zionism and Settler Colonialism. And he's got a whole slide of all the different segments and why it is actually not very accurate to just say Christian evangelicals because right. that's way too wide of an umbrella. But, you know, getting back to the question and then getting back to the example, uh, what was happening with George H.W. Bush? Uh, George H.W. Bush said, uh, I'm just a little lonely guy up here on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I'm trying to freeze settlement financing by threatening loan guarantee withhold, withhold, uh, withholding those. And who was on the other side? Who was to his right meeting with mainly establishment Jewish groups in New York campaigning against him, saying, I would uh, jump in a trench with a rifle and die for Israel, who was appealing for money by getting to the right of George H.W. Bush. Was it the Christian Zionist he was talking to? No, it wasn't. Bill Clinton was all about getting these large establishment groups named in the article on his side yep. as the guy who would not threaten the groups that actually lobby for things like loan guarantees to Israel. Yeah. And you know, and you who know I love that story it's, so much, Grant, because, yeah. you know, I was in high school at the time, but I was very yeah. interested, and I was not a partisan, but I was very interested in the uh, Bush-Clinton election of 1992. And that was even right at the time where I saw the chart that, like, oh, this no-name governor from Arkansas is actually a member of all these elite organizations and runs around yeah. and it has run around in circles of power for a very long time and this kind of deal. So right. I was inoculated against supporting anyone or anything like that. So I don't mean to say that, but you know, I was just in high school. So I had, you know, the best access I had to information was mostly just TV news stuff and what have you. And I just had absolutely no sense whatsoever that differences between who supports Israel more was playing into the electoral politics of that campaign oh, yeah. season whatsoever. Oh, yeah. And when oh, I read man. Phil Weiss wrote this piece where he yeah. says even Bush Sr. himself blamed the Israel lobby for his loss that they had completely switched to support Bill Clinton instead of him and even switched to really opposing him and that that right. had really made the difference and that he himself had blamed them. And I was completely astonished to learn that. Uh, well, not well, exactly, but it was another you know huge example of just... You know, the way you really kind of have, you don't get to see who's behind the scenes. In fact, I'm going to go off on one more. Yeah. In, in, there's a great Bill Hicks bit about how they take you in the back room and they show, when, <laughs> once you're elected, they take you in the back room and they show you footage yeah, of the Kennedy the assassination yeah, from an angle got, you've never seen before. Yeah, right. Have you heard yeah, that one? Yeah. Yeah, and the he, CIA gun but he calls him, or whatever. Yeah, he goes, well, they take in this back room with these 12 industrialist, capitalist, scum, right. you know, bags, yeah. whatever. But then there's an actual real story there. Oh, and then once, and then he even does Bill Clinton. Uh, any questions? And Clinton says, just what my agenda is. First, we bomb Baghdad. You got it. And he's talking about the reaction to the alleged assassination plot against H.W. Bush. But there's like the real history there. And yeah. what it really was, was it was the Israelis. It wasn't industrialist, capitalist, whatever Bill thought it was. It was the Israel lobby that said to right. Bill Clinton, you cannot normalize relations with Iraq or Iran. You have to do the dual containment policy. And it was Martin right. Indyk who was pushing it and his whole group right. that was behind it. And once the Kuwaitis exaggerated and faked the plot against H.W. Bush... That was the excuse for, the, for I guess, that was the last straw for Bill Clinton to go ahead and give in to that policy of dual containment through the 1990s and inaugurated it with the missile strike on Baghdad that killed the artist and all these other people and all that. Yeah. So it really was exactly the Bill Hicks joke, only it was the Israelis. And as somebody who lived through that time right then, I had no idea that there was a controversy over which side of Israeli politics supports which candidate here and that it matters. I mean, yeah. it might as you might as well have said the Italians were fixing the election or something as far as I knew.
Well, George H.W. Bush was making some of the biggest moves that had ever been made to hold the Israelis to account. I, I don't think anyone except for maybe Kennedy had ever done something that got the Israel lobby so riled up as his threat against loan guarantees tied the settlement building. It was just considered to be completely unacceptable to the lobby. And so, you know, the same as when JFK was saying, we don't want Israel to go nuclear. We don't want them to be, you know, uh, doing anything with Demona. We know about it. We know that you've been lying to us. I mean, and also, you know, had some plans to uh, push them on refugee return, which was just unacceptable to the Israelis. So well, and now in that election grant, was it that? The Israel lobby really just threw so much weight behind Bill Clinton that that really helped him. Well, I mean, obviously, Perot was a major you know, factor in this, too. I don't know if that had anything to do with the Israelis. I guess I wouldn't be surprised if it did. Or, you know, was it, um, you know, actively working against H.W. Bush and and working to make the evangelical vote stay home and, and prevent him from winning and saying he's not really one of us and that kind of messaging or was their turnout essentially, you know, foregone and, and didn't make much of a difference. It was really just their support for Clinton rather than their um, kind of targeting Bush's support among rank and file Republicans or do you know? I, you know, I, I can only, I can't, I can't say this or that action was what tipped his apple cart over, but there was immediate heavy coordinated, negative news coverage and again clinton got right to his right and bashed him and there was you know a serious campaign to questioning whether he was anti-semitic and that sort of thing so all of the things that would typically come out of the lobby to punish a president who did something like that happened um, now can i say that this article in this newspaper that was tangentially bashing him on the economy or something like that was really tied to displeasure over the lobby. That's that's not something I can produce any evidence of. But again, he attributes his loss to upsetting, you know, this group. And he did <laughs> give a relative measurement of their magnitude. And when he was talking about doing his lonely little guy speech right. in which he said, you know, I'm just one, you know, I'm just the president. I don't actually run this place. There must be a thousand lobbyists up on Capitol Hill. Well, who is he talking about? He wasn't talking yeah. again about the moral majority or the, you know, Christian coalition, which would have existed back then and not Kufi, which right. didn't exist. He was, he was talking and inflating the influence, I think, of the APAX, the AJC, the RJC, all of these, ADL, because they all came out against it and just pounded him and pounded him yeah. for trying to get a tiny, you know, a modicum of accountability. And I think, you so, know, reportedly, James Baker had said, although, you know, I'm yeah, sure it was yeah. mostly in jest, that no, F the Jews. He said it. He said it. He, he said it. Oh, was it like on TV or something? Do you know? Is there a video of it? No, yeah. no, but he doesn't deny yeah. it. He oh, doesn't yeah. deny it. No, I mean, and, and I'm sure that it was, depending on the context of who he was saying it to and the amount of laughter around it and whatever, it I'd I'd be willing to give him a little bit of uh, benefit of the doubt on the context. But he says, F the Jews, they don't vote for us anyway. And then He did say that. That he was did the, say that. Yeah. Yeah. So you could see how well, that would motivate a lot of people to say, you know what, that's right, but not only that, I donate Democrat too. How do you like me now? <laughs> kind of thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, people I mean, take stuff I, like that the wrong way sometimes, you know. Right, but the, as as it you know as it's argued that Tom Delay, or excuse me, um, the uh, yeah, you the were referring, yeah, had the power to marshal a truly relevant giant group of kind of single issue voters. I, you know, he could have definitely created some heat but once again when i talk about lobbying and this comes out of my book big israel how israel's lobby moves america mm -hmm. what i'm talking about are people who are usually a relatively small group who are actively doing the things 
to write the policy, work on legislation, are spending money and disclosing their lobbying efforts. Right. And I'm not talking so much about people who are just interested in something because you can be interested in all sorts of things, but that doesn't mean you're a lobby. Yeah. You can and be look, a, a I mean, you can give a fair amount of credit to the Republican Party for keeping evangelicals interested on this issue and that it plays a part of their motivation to continue to vote Republican. And that's fine. And well, still, it is what a, it is, yeah. but it's, as you're pointing out, it's not the same thing as what is really the deciding factor here. It's, yeah, it's not, it's not really lobbying. I mean, and there's a whole slew of issues, whether it's abortion, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, school prayer, whether it's flag burning, all the, all of these issues, plus Israel, these things all kind of come together in a giant package that they've been working on for a long time. And, uh, it's, it's interesting, but again, in this study that I did, you know, when you look at what the Christian coalition does with its lobbying, they almost never do anything on Israel these days. So, um, and you look at Kufi, which is this new player, which I hope we get into a little bit. Um, they are so small in terms of actual lobbying. Like they are going to push this legislation. They are demand. They're sitting down with the DOD and demanding that they buy some products from this or that Israeli defense. Well, let's just call it a military contractor. They're not doing it. Okay. And it raises serious doubts. Again, when we're talking about an advocacy wing of what is certainly uh, an affinity ecosystem. Yeah. I mean, you, you, there's, they're definitely, they have affinity, you know, they, they talk about Israel night to honor Israel, all this stuff, but are they an effective lobbying? Are they writing legislation? Are they meeting with the D no, and they're not. And, and even uh, for what they are, they kind of might count as APAC anyway. I mean, I'm sure you saw this thing. You can't make this stuff up, man. If you did, I would say, come on, Grant. But no, really, it turns out that Ehud Barak's cousin right. ran Kufi. Right. So there is John Hagee is essentially the figurehead for what amounts to a Trojan horse for the Israel lobby anyway. Literally the cousin of the former defense minister and prime minister of Israel runs the goddamn thing. Or well, ran, ran it. it. I, I don't know if he's yeah. still there. but David Brog, is that who you're talking about? Um, I don't know. So, yeah, so... There's that, but there's also the fact that just to start up, they took a, a lot of money from sources that typically only give to the Jewish establishment lobby um, to get set up. And then there's this whole recent thing that they're actually taking money from the Israeli government, that whole thing that came out in, I know you've talked about it on your show, uh, in the big Jewish Daily Forward article by Alon Pincus. So... You know, the you know thing please that, elaborate about that, because that is such an important story, Grant. Yeah, it's, and it's such a sad thing that he retired. Aiden Pink is his name. And he's been talking about this space for a while that uh, Kufi actually took some money from a cutout set up by the Israeli government, which was actively funding things like passing anti-BDS legislation at the state level. So it's about as bad as it can get in terms of a Foreign Agents Registration Act case. I mean, yeah. if if they were found to have been receiving money and direction, just like the Justice Department ordered AJ Plus to register as a foreign agent of the Qatari government, then Kufi, if there was a sort of equal application of the law, would be required to start filing Foreign Agent Registration Act reports because, uh, you know, again, alleged in the article, they were lobbying on behalf of the Israeli government, but it was well hidden. So it's a huge story, um, probably won't go any further anymore. Um, and it kind of blew a bit of a hole in this whole thing that, oh yeah, Kufi came out of, you know, the, uh, the this association of churches and Pastor Hagee, he just rubbed two sticks together and and voila, they put together this lobby. Yet yeah, no, that's not what happened. So it is, it's clearly emerging as more of a cutout than yeah. anything else. So you've Man. got the money, you've got the leadership, you've got the Israeli government. There. It's so impressive, isn't it? I mean, I love this psyop. Just, I mean, it's a horrible, hateful thing, but 
just the chutzpah to put on this scam where here's what we're going to do. We're going to astroturf this movement to pass right. laws in the states. Yeah. And you only yeah. need, you don't need all 50 or anything, but to make a movement out of it, to pass these laws, to protect the people from being enslaved under Sharia. Right. Which is right. only, there's only one purpose for that, which is just to pretend as though there's the threat of enslavement under Sharia that needs to be defended from, which is just yeah. a nice way of saying that you are victims of the evil Muslims, just like us Israelis are. And that's the only reason anybody hates us is because they're evil Muslims and evil Islam makes bad people, makes good people into bad people who hate other people just for being Jews or Americans or see how it goes. And and that's all it meant. And the whole thing was just completely, you couldn't have made up a bigger bunch of hot air than the threat well, of that. Yeah, I hear Sharia is going to be ruling Montana at any time now. And what are the people of Montana ever going to do to defend themselves from the yeah. incoming Al-Qaeda juggernaut onslaught that is overthrowing their legislature and judicial system right now? Who will protect why, them before it's too late? But they got away with this, yeah. and they just pushed it and pushed it and pushed it through, I don't know, 30 states or something like that. Yeah, Eli Clifton huge, and others have done number. really great work on this stuff. Yeah, but why did they do it? Why did And the, the Israeli, Israeli government, government financing why? the whole thing. But why, Scott? Why? Well, because why they have they to fool it? Americans into supporting them, because what they do is no. wrong, Grant. No, the real reason, the real reason, <laughs> <laughs> the real reason is... Israel badly needs to get into a number of U.S. states and set up businesses and participate more in the U.S. military industrial complex, the food services industry. They want to get into uh, building all sorts of things uh, like solar energy. And the, and the reason they want to come to the U.S. is their own market is so tiny and so this is, uh, they made a huge push in Virginia, and this comes out of that book you just referenced, the Israel Lobby Interstate Government, to pass an anti-BDS law. And it's obvious now that they wanted to do that because they didn't want a quarter billion dollars worth of solar energy facilities to be jeopardized. They didn't want anyone to start questioning all of the huge number of state funds going to subsidize the building of their headquarters in Arlington. They didn't want people saying, why are we subsidizing Sabra Hamas? Why are we subsidizing this, this uh, funky Israeli bulletproof glass maker, orange safety glass in Greensville with all these state, county and other subsidies? They didn't want people to be able to fight that stuff. So they, you know, they said there's not going to be any BDS in Virginia. And you know what? They failed because there's a very active coalition for human rights called VCHR there that said, oh, no, you're not going to pass that here. And uh, But they're still trying to build businesses because, again, the Israeli market is tiny. They want to keep building their giant trade surplus, which uh, you know they helped put into place in uh, the 1985 trade deal. I won't call it free trade because it's not. It's, it's managed trade. And they really need the business. So that's why the Israeli government felt it had to get involved and got caught. Hey guys, Scott Horton here for Mike Swanson's great book, The War State. It's about the rise of the military industrial complex and the power elite after World War II during the administrations of Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, and Jack Kennedy. It's a very enlightening take on this definitive era on America's road to world empire. The War State by Mike Swanson. Find it in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org. Hey, y'all. Mike Swanson is a successful Wall Street trader with an Austrian school understanding of the markets, and therefore he has great advice to share with you. Check out Mike's work and sign up for his list at wallstreetwindow.com. And that's what you'll get, a window into all of Mike's trades. He'll explain what he's buying and selling and expecting and why. I know you'll learn and earn a lot. WallStreetWindow.com. That's WallStreetWindow.com. Um, and listen, I'm so sorry because we talked about everything under the sun and you got, you know, the Christian Zionism right in the title here. But a huge part of this important article is you go through and you really explain who are the groups in Washington, D.C. who really do exercise this influence. And obviously, right. APAC gets all the attention, but that ain't fair. A lot of these other guys, I know the Israel Project doesn't exist anymore, right? But that was a really bad one. 
exposed in those uh, Al Jazeera documentaries about the lobby. Yeah, but they were a PR organization. And again, I think it helps to have some precision of language here. I would not say that the Israel Project was a lobbying organization. They okay. were another sort of disinfo and PR campaign. They were like the Ministry of Foreign Affairs PR outfit, and they really functioned as a de facto one. Uh, the things they did were really heavily involved in uh, image creation. That was the reason they were set up. And they're gone because they were exposed as being what they were. Um, and they alienated a donor and goodbye, the Israel Project. But it's the ZOA, the AJC, the ADL, the RGC, and APAC. Wait, wait, wait. Slow down. Say that all again, but in slower motion, please. ZOA, AJC, yeah. Is yeah. There, what, what all do these letters stand for again now? So you have... The Zionist Organization of America, which is a very hardcore, ultra, ultra conservative, Israel can do no wrong group that came out uh, and it's been around for decades. And it's it was ordered six times to register as a foreign agent because of their ties to Israel. So they're super hardcore. They raise money and they spend most of it or a huge section of it lobbying the American Jewish Committee is one of these really, really old, 100-year-plus-old organizations that's not only been around forever but sprouted other organizations like the Anti-Defamation League. They account for 2% of the actual lobbying budget, the Anti-Defamation League, its offspring, 3%, heavily, heavily involved in Israel lobbying, want to redefine anti-Semitism to include criticism of Israel, blah, blah, blah. And then finally, the Republican Jewish Coalition, which is a nonprofit that really works to make sure, you know, this is, <laughs> this kind of proves that none of this stuff is inherent doctrine in the Republican Party. Tries to keep the Republicans in line 100% behind Israel. I um, remember when they disinvited Ron Paul from their debate back in 2008 or 12, I think 12, where yeah. they were terrified of what he might say. Which, right. if, if they ever Googled Ron Paul on Israel, it's always like, we ought to respect their independence to make their own decisions, but we shouldn't be on the hook for all the decisions that they make, which is a right. perfectly libertarian constitutionalist type but point of view on the matter. Much. But they, yeah. they can't even have that inside the walls of discussion here. No, sir. They brook, brook no, def yeah, no, you, they brook no, absolutely no departure from absolute 100% support. And then you have APAC, which really rolls up it's the designated lobby you know its view is that it should be really the only one up there lobbying and that everyone else should work through them and so they're the ones who are i would say responsible for this massive transfer of weapons to israel and you know it's it's uh you can't you simply cannot say that christian zionists have had a major hand in giving israel more U.S. foreign aid than was delivered in the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe after World War II. Yeah. They just weren't there. They weren't doing that lobbying. And it kind of argues again to the case that one of the reasons APAC in particular has been working since the 60s to build up Christian groups that were willing to be on its side is that they do form an extremely good foil because just like is happening now, the Christian Zionists can take all the heat. Well, they're the ones who move the embassy to Israel. They're the ones who have this Secretary of State talking from some rooftop of uh, in Jerusalem for the uh, Republican National. It's all the Christian Zionists that have done this, and these are terrible policies. But you just can't blame these large establishment organizations yeah. that write the legislation and do the real lobbying. So okay, now we're over time, but just real quick, what about the role of Bernard Marcus? And Sheldon Adelson is in the news. He's given a hundred million dollars the last, you know, two years ago and two years before that, and he's going to give fifty million dollars to Trump for the rest of the campaign season. It says in the news yesterday. And you have uh, right. Paul Singer and what? It's a handful, four or five, very important right-wing Jewish billionaires who are putting up just an absolute ton of money. Now, how yeah. does that fit into all of this? The way you're characterizing these are the lobbies and these are the other interests at play here. So there's a pie divided in three parts. There are individuals like the Christian Zionists who, you know, because they're not organized to do legislation, they don't matter. There's a second group, wealthy elites. They move policy too. 
So all those guys you mentioned, they're absolutely influential on policy, but they're not really a lobby. They're more like coordinated contributors. And they also give, you know, Sheldon Aylison was a big donor to APAC before he formed another group and backed it, uh, the Israel American Council, which as far as I can tell, doesn't lobby on Capitol Hill. So yeah, you have the elites, they're extremely important too, but they don't write legislation. They have to work through other groups to do that. You know, lobbying is a very particular thing. It's trying to get laws passed. It's trying to get doctrines adopted. It's trying to get officials Uh, in the Pentagon to do certain things. And so I would say, you know, they have an impact and they come in through these groups as well. They give through these groups, but they're a separate, separate section. And I don't really cover them here. I don't cover Israeli defense corporations, which also lobby. I don't cover anything because the, the question at hand here was, let's talk about this meme that Christian Zionists are the biggest Israel lobby. And, you know, again, the real issue here is nobody really knows how many members Kufi has. Nobody knows what its revenue is because it's an association of churches and has never disclosed that. Nobody knows where it gets its money, but it's, you know, that's becoming clear too. And nobody knows or even wrote about how much it spends lobbying through its lobbying division. But now we know. Is it significant? No, it's not. Yep. All right. Well, I'm sorry that we're over time here, but uh, thanks very much for your time. Again, everybody, that's Grant Smith. He's at IRMEP, the Institute for Research, Middle Eastern Policy, IRMEP.org. And he wrote uh, Big Israel and, um, of course, uh, the intro, the Israel lobby interstate government. So let's divert about the nuclear weapons and all of that. And you know what? Take uh, 30 seconds to talk about this uh, video series you've been doing in place of your big conference this year. Yeah, so we couldn't do our big conference at the National Press Club, and so now we're doing a series with some of our speakers slated to speak there in 2021, others aren't, but it's staying on the issue, and it's called Israel Lobby Con Extra. So if you go to IsraelLobbyCon.org, you can see all the videos we've done, and we typically put a lot of value added into those, and uh, we've got some more coming up, including a fantastic one next Wednesday with Walter Hickson. Uh, who's a professor who's written books about foreign policy and the Israel lobby and settler colonialism. So we're going to have this sort of cross-disciplinary discussion with Walter. He's a fascinating guy. And uh, so that'll be noon on Wednesday. And going to get that link out really soon here, Scott. Great. Israel yes. Lobby, is, yeah, IsraelLobbyCon.org. Yes. Give me some notice. All right. Thanks, uh, everybody. The great Grant Smith. Appreciate it, bud. Thanks, Scott. The Scott Horton Show and Anti-War Radio can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A., APSRadio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.